Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through to 21. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Good morning, everybody. My name's Gareth. Um, I lead the church here along with Lizzie, my wife, who's currently with Toby at home. Toby is still self-isolating, but we'll be thrilled because every time I mention any of our kids, I have to pay them a pound. So um, that's one silver lining in his cloud today. I wonder if you saw in the news this week that more than five million people have become millionaires in the last year through the pandemic. More than five million people have become millionaires through this pandemic. Well, today we're thinking about a kingdom vision, God's vision for global poverty. Because perhaps like me, you're very aware that we live in a world where the divide between rich and poor seems to be getting bigger. Now, it turns out, actually, that extreme poverty is on the decline. But, as we'll hear in a moment, that doesn't make it great news for everybody around our world. Well, last week, um, my kids uh, or family and I, we watched the film Captain Phillips. Anyone seen the film Captain Phillips? Yeah, Tom Hanks being the captain of this big container ship, a container ship from America, which was sailing to Africa with international aid in the containers. And it's taken over by Somali pirates. Uh, they take the captain hostage in the hope of being able to get a ransom worth millions of pounds from the USA because they know how insurance works. And yet the story ends, sorry if you haven't watched it, a bit of a killer of a storyline here. Uh, the story ends by the US Navy coming, killing three of the pirates and taking one as a prisoner, taking him back to the US where he is currently serving over 30 years in a US prison. It's a pretty intense movie, watching the drama unfold on this container ship. And the whole point of watching a movie is to gain empathy with the people in the story, right? We watch a movie and we kind of imagine ourselves in that situation there. We do that because of this thing called empathy. We're able to kind of experience the sort of emotions. And in fact, I was reading a, a, an article about the psychology of empathy recently. And it's not just that, that we watch and we think, oh, I can imagine a little bit what that must have been like. Isn't that terrible? No, no, no. When we're watching a movie, we actually feel the same thing that the actor is feeling. That's why good actors are good actors. They help us feel the very thing that that person might have been experiencing. And the film is set up to show the power, yes, of the US Navy, of how they came and saved this captain who had been selfless and heroic in trying to save his crew. But the empathy worked for us as a family, not just for the captain, but for the pirates as well. I thought the film showed very well the big challenges that we face in our world. 
You've got Captain Phillips who wakes up here. I mean, he's not a wealthy guy, but he wakes up in a nice house. He has some breakfast, has a coffee, he drives, uh, he sends his kids off to school, drives to the airport, kisses his wife goodbye so that he can fly the plane. Uh, not he doesn't fly the plane, he can fly in the plane to the place uh, where the ship, container ship goes off. He goes off on his container ship where he can email his wife whenever he likes. He can drink coffee and have as much food as he would like to. Things are pretty okay. You juxtapose that with the life of the Somalis that you see. They're fishermen living on the coast of Somalia. And yet international fishing laws have meant that there's not really any fish left to catch. But they are subject to overlords who send their minions with machine guns saying, we need more money now. And they have no means by which to bring in an income because there aren't any fish left. And so the only thing they can think of is maybe they can do what they've heard others do and take over a container ship. And it's that desperation that they have that causes them to make the kinds of sacrifice they were willing to make. It messes with our head because we want things to be right. And we worship a God that we call righteous. That means he is right. He knows what is right and he does what is right. And he calls us to do the same. So what do we do in the world in which we live? That film is just one story that captures the global injustice that we see in the world around us. The reading that we had from Grace, from Luke chapter 4, is known as Jesus' manifesto. It's him laying out what it is that he's here to do, why it is that he's come. The mission that he believes God called him to, as he understands after having been in the desert, that, wow, that, that miraculous birth thing, yeah, I am God's son. Oh my goodness, God's got a big ministry for me to do. And it's summed up in Isaiah. It's summed up in seeing the blind being able to see. The prisoners being set free. The poor having good news spoken to them. Well, just think about this for a minute. If you're poor, what is good news? Jesus loves you. Yeah, that's, that is good news. What would be really great news is that Jesus loves me enough and is able to help me provide for my family. That's good news. Yes, we've got a hope in heaven. And that's great. But I'm alive right now. And so good news to the poor doesn't just mean good news of when we die, we go to be with Jesus. But good news that God is with us right now. Jesus said, this scripture that I've just read to you, today it's fulfilled in your hearing. The good news to the poor fulfilled in Jesus. Freedom for prisoners fulfilled in Jesus. Recovery of sight for the blind fulfilled in Jesus. Are you getting the vibe here? The oppressed set free fulfilled in Jesus. Oh, we're almost a Pentecostal church. <laughs> the poor, the prisoners, the blind, the oppressed, the least, the last and the lost that's Jesus' manifesto. And for those of us who follow Jesus, his priorities are our priorities, right? Because we follow him. And so we say, Lord, this is what I want with my life. But what do you want? And he says, this is my manifesto. And we go, okay, how do I work that out then in my life? So just take a moment, think about your life. Is Jesus' priorities your priorities? 
Are we bringing good news? All through the Old Testament and on into the New, we see God interested in the outsider. He reminded his people that they were slaves in Egypt and he set them free and so he didn't want them to oppress others. For example, in Exodus 22 verse 21, I think we've got this scripture on the screen. Exodus 22, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner for you were foreigners in Egypt. And you can kind of say the other end of the story of the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah makes it a sign that God's people are genuinely following him. It's kind of a if then. If you do this, then you will be under God's blessing. This is what it says in Jeremiah 7. If, uh, sorry, if you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, If you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. And then it goes on with some promises. This stuff is high on God's agenda from the beginning of the Old Testament through to the end of the Old Testament and on into the ministry of Jesus. And we know, don't we, that things aren't quite right. Oxfam released a report last year called Time to Care. And this report said that the world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth than 6.9 billion people. You're going to have to let that sink in for a minute. That's quite hard to get your head around, okay? The top, one, the wealthiest 1% of people on earth have twice as much wealth than 6.9 billion people. That doesn't seem quite right, does it? The World Bank released a report in 2018 that said that nearly half of the world is trying to live on $5.50 a day or less. Now, I did a little bit of maths because I was like, I don't really know what that means. It doesn't sound like very much, but what does that mean? So I worked it out and I did a conversion into pounds. Let's say you take two days a week for a weekend, because, you know, we want to have a weekend. That means your income for a year is £1,027 a year. 47% of the population of our world live with that level of income. If you're anything like me then, you're sitting there thinking, yeah, okay, well, so, so what do we do? I want to do something. How, how do we respond? It is easy to feel overwhelmed and powerless. If God's kingdom vision is to reach the least, the last, and the last, how, how then do we respond? Well, some of you know I wrote uh, I released a book earlier this year called Stones and Ripples. And I talk in the book about two different ways that we as a church are able to reach out and serve others. One is that we do it in an organic way. And the other is that we do it in an organized way. Let me explain what I mean. The first, the organic way, is that you and I are flesh and bones and we have relationships with all sorts of people. We are we have what psychologists might call agency, the ability to make a decision and do something about it. An organic mission, serving others in an organic way, is simply for us trying to take responsibility ourselves that when we bump up against a need, we do something about it. It's us as individuals, perhaps walking past a homeless person and not just trying to ignore them, but perhaps instead looking them in the eye and saying, hey, how are you doing? I've learned so much from Lizzie, my wife, who's brilliant at working with the least, the last and the lost. That just asking someone's name gives them a massive amount of dignity. How are you doing? My name's Gareth. What's your name? 
blessing someone simply with an exchange of hello, not ignoring them like so many others do, or just chucking them a little coin in the hope that it might do something. Or perhaps if you've got a spare moment, say, can I get you something? Do you need a a sandwich or, or, or a drink? And going in and you taking a few moments of your time to be a blessing to someone who comes amongst that category of the least, the last, and the lost. That's an organic way of doing it, an individual response. And I want to encourage us to be the kind of church that makes people go, blimey, they were nice. I wonder why. We've seen some amazing acts of generosity and humanity through this last year as we've suffered through COVID. And it's been great. But I want us, church, to continue that. Not just do it because we're in a global pandemic and everyone's freaking out. But doing it because Jesus is Lord and he has a dominion over my time and my decisions and my priorities. And as I'm saying, this is as much a challenge to me as it is to any of you listening right now. How can we respond in an organic way? Now, that doesn't solve the answer of global global poverty. I get it. But it does mean that we are allowing empathy to impact our lives and our decisions because of our love for Jesus. So you have an impact as an individual. But there's also an organized response. There's organic as individuals, but there's organized as a community. And I wanted to take some time today to tell you about how we as a community are responding to the challenges of global poverty. Because there's poverty right here in our city and there's poverty all around the world. And I want to tell you about two specific ways that we as a church are seeking to try to do something to respond to Jesus' manifesto. Rick has already prayed a bit about bags of hope these bags, thank you so much to everyone who donates the things that are on the shopping list. The, the bags, when you bring them, they, they go to one of four places. They either go to people who are struggling in our own local community. And we have a food bank on a Tuesday afternoon, food bank distribution center where people can come. And the prayer is to turn that into a a cafe where people can just come and hang out and have a little bit of community. And if you happen to have some time on a Tuesday, I know that Lizzie would love to hear from you so that we can have a bit of a team begin to gather. It's not a convenient time of the week and you may be working and that's okay. But if you're not, we'd love to hear from you so that you could help be a blessing to those people who are really struggling with very, very little for whatever reason. So they go to local deprived people. They they go to a homeless shelter that we work with so that people who are struggling and have no home get a little bit of dignity with a bag of hope. They go to asylum seekers. People have, for one reason or another, had to leave their country and they ended up here and have nothing. And yet they get 10 items that give them a little bit of dignity. And then finally, the fourth category, going to, uh, it's a family show. So, uh, women who use their bodies to create income for themselves. How about that? Do we know what we're talking about? Giving them a little bit of dignity. And as Lizzie and Michelle and others have worked with these women who are very much in the category of the least, the last, and the lost. Discovering that actually just being able to get them a home to live in isn't necessarily going to help them. Because there are so many complex needs going on in their lives. And and Lizzie's been exploring an idea that we came across when we visited Hong Kong back in 2019. And we met this amazing lady called Jackie Pullinger, who's been working with people coming off the streets and off drug addiction for 50 plus years. Seeing Jesus restore them 
through sometimes a very long and painful process, but loving them just for who they are, seeking to fulfill the manifesto of Jesus from Isaiah 61 by offering them a home to live in. It's not just a house where we hope that they're going to do okay and we put a little bit of support around them and a social worker visits them every so often, but a family where they grow in love and are able to begin to feel safe to build new rhythms of their life. And Lizzie's had a crazy journey for the last four or five months or so, being put in touch with some people who own a house and being put in touch with all sorts of people who might want to fund this kind of thing. And it seems like the Lord keeps opening doors because our prayer is like, Lord, it'd be really great if doors stopped opening. But, but if it's your will, then Lord, if there's an open door, we're going to keep walking through it. And there are open doors And so when we hear the stories of faith, as we've heard earlier on today, they encourage us and inspire us. But oh my goodness, it feels like God is on the move saying, yes, I want to do something for these women in our city. And here's the thing, guys. You may be at work on a Tuesday or you may think, well, I can't. What can I do to help in a home for vulnerable women? Well, what you can do is keep giving because as you give, the money that's being given is helping invest into that work. Your life, the the way that you are bearing fruit in your life by working, as Simon was talking about a few weeks ago, is bringing you something of an income which is helping serve others because we're doing this together. That's how it works. It's not that you're bad and they're good because you're doing a normal job and they're doing something different. It's that we together are saying we want to do something and we support this work. So that's what we're doing in our local community. Oh, I forgot to mention. Uh, It's been so crazy. Liz has been talking to the uh, Andy Burnham's advisor on homelessness. They want to get behind it. Uh, Greater Manchester Police, they want to get behind it. All, All these kind of connections that Lizzie never thought she'd have are opening up to her with the Lord going, I'm in this. Will you keep walking this journey to serve the least, the last, and the lost? So that's what we're doing in our local area. What about the rest of the world? Well, we as a church have a partnership with Tear Fund, which is a Christian charity based in the UK, but works in over 50 of the poorest countries in the world, including Tanzania. And Tanzania is a place where we as a church community are investing into a project to roll out what's called CCMP, yes. The Church and Community Mobilization Project, yes. It does sound a bit perplexing, I agree. Anyway, that's what it's called and I was talking this week to these two lovely people on Zoom. They've got a photo of them. This is Vincent and Rahima. Vincent Moyo and Rahima Shu, who are working on the ground to try and help make sure that the money we are giving goes to help people in the Morogoro district in the centre of Tanzania. Now, um, quick heads up, 2020 wasn't a great year. Not just because of the global pandemic, but because someone did a little whistleblowing report, turns out there's some financial shenanigans going on. And so they had to pause some of the support that was being offered just while they worked all that out. I'm telling you this because I want you to know that the money we're giving is accountable. People are taking care to make sure that the money that we are giving is going to the thing it's meant to go to. So they pressed pause. They did a little investigation. The country ahead of tier fund and the guy heading up finance resigned. It turned out there was a really good reason why they resigned, if you know what I mean. And so Vincent is the head of tier fund Malawi, but he's actually looking after tier fund Tanzania. And Rahima 
is now helping. She worked previously on the team. She's, you, if you were around, you might have seen her on a video that we showed maybe 18 months ago or so. But Rahim is still on the ground, and she is responsible for training a guy called Gideon, who is not on the call. But Gideon is the guy that we are supporting through our giving. And Gideon's job is to go around to the churches in Morogoro District and try to help them do some Bible studies. And these Bible studies are basically helping people to realize that what God has given to them, they can make the most of and begin to make something of a profit. And Rahima was telling me, I did have a video, but the quality was terrible, so I'm just going to have to tell you what she told me. Um, She works as a program director uh, and was telling me that in the past, when people in the villages used to get handouts from the West, right, just here's a bit of money, often it would just get spent on drink. This CCMP process is taking the church through five Bible studies, like the loaves and the fishes, where the little boy brought his five loaves and two fish and gave them to Jesus. And Jesus blessed them and multiplied them. And then 5,000 people were fed. We know the story. is what we hear in Sunday school. The challenge of CCMP is to say, God has given you something that he wants to bless. They talk about Adam and Eve a little bit like Sarah was doing a few weeks ago, how, how we're given creation to steward And these Bible studies are saying, look, God has given you these things. You can steward them well. And so what is happening on the ground in Tanzania and carried on, believe it or not, even when our money wasn't getting there because people believe in this so much. The Bible studies were happening and people started to make little credit unions together where they used to put a little bit of money each week. I said it in the past tense. It's happening right now. A little bit of money each week. And once you've been investing for three months, you get to borrow against the money that you've put in. And get this. This is what people are buying. Remember, this is not with Western handouts. This is not the white saviour complex. This is us supporting people on the ground in Tanzania to make the very most of what God has given to them. And they're using their own money to buy things like seeds that they can plant and grow crops. Farming equipment so their farming can be even more effective. School fees so their kids can get educated the way that they weren't educated. Iron sheets for the roofs of their houses instead of having to collect grass each season to roof their houses. They're buying cows to produce milk to create more income to pay off their debt so that other people can have more money to borrow too. This is what our money is doing as we support people on the ground, seeing people work themselves out of poverty. Is it answering all the big questions? No. But it's doing what we can with what we have and just like with the vulnerable women every time you give you're supporting this work you can go home or turn off the screen today knowing that people in Tanzania's lives are radically different because you responded in faith and said I want to align myself with Jesus's manifesto and that is a reason to smile I want to encourage us then as a community to be organic, just to respond out of compassion and empathy when we can, but to be organized as well. And as a community, seek, try, uh, continue to seek investing in those who are the least, the last, and the lost around the world. Sarah did a brilliant job a few weeks ago when we were thinking about the climate crisis, how do we respond? And her invitation was this, what's the next step you can take? And it's the same question I've got for us today. What's the next step you can take? 
I'm not saying you need to become, you know, somebody who works for Tear Fund. I'm not saying you need to necessarily become a lawyer to work with International Justice Mission and go in and release people who are in uh, trafficking situations. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what's the next step that you and I might take? It might be as simple as buying fair trade goods like chocolate and sugar and coffee so that workers get paid a decent wage. It might be that you start to or maybe increase your giving to the church so that we can continue to invest in these areas. It may be that you've got a whole bunch of extra cash because of COVID and you don't really know what to do because you haven't been able to do anything. Maybe you could support tier funds. They've got an appeal right now for a major crisis going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Or maybe another international agency that you know and trust. But it all starts with prayer. Right? That's where it starts, that's where it continues, and that's where it ends. Could you just commit to praying for global poverty? For those billions who don't have as much as we do? What might be the next step for you? in joining in God's vision to end global poverty and injustice. Let's just take a moment to be quiet and pray. We often use the phrase that we want to stand against injustice. And so in this silence whether you're watching at home or you're here in the room, I want to give you the opportunity to say, Lord, I want to align myself to your manifesto. I want to do what I can organically, organizationally, to seek your will. To do something about the poverty we see around us. And when you want to make that kind of declaration, you don't need to make a song and dance about it. You just stand. Stand with me. Stand with your convictions. Stand with your prayers. Stand with your desire to take the next step. Come, Holy Spirit. We stand, Lord, not because it's convenient, but because we want your heart for the world in which we live. We stand, Lord, not because it's easy, but it's because it's what you gave your life for. Jesus, you said we'll always have the poor with us, but we don't want to take that as an excuse to not do anything. Because in your kingdom, there is righteousness and justice. And so we seek your kingdom in our day, in our time. We stand because we want to do our bit. Our hearts break, Lord, for the imbalance of rich and poor. We can't wave a magic wand and solve it. But we can try and do our bit. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and fill us afresh?
to stand up for those who perhaps don't have a voice. To invest some of our income for those who earn so much less. To be a church that loves the least, the last, and the lost. Whether we walk past them in the street or they live thousands of miles away. Give us compassion. Give us empathy. Give us your wisdom to know how we might respond and take the next step in giving our yes to you. In Jesus' name we pray.